it shaped since then? Uh, well, before I even answer that question, I'm, I'm kind of shocked that you're all here. Uh, <laughs> thank you for coming. Uh, firstly, I, I don't know whether I cling to this as a bit of a nervous habit, but I love to tell the story of uh, the very first time I ever did something like this, which was, you know, was in 2000. So, um, you know, 19 years ago, and I got sent from Sydney. So I come from s on the east side of Australia. They sent me over to Western Australia to a town called Margaret River. And uh, it's a beautiful town. And everyone said, oh, Margaret River, this is going to be great. They love books in Margaret River. They love the arts, you know, and it's a wine region. It's going to be great, you know. And of course, I went over there to do the reading in the in the, the local library, 6.30. I remember every detail, you know, <laughs> it's not like I hold a grudge, all right? And anyway, I got there to do the reading and of course, no one turned up. <laughs> and uh, that's not even the best part. Uh, <laughs> the best part is that the librarian still made me read from my book. <laughs> just to her and uh, you know now all these years later <laughs> I think if that happened now I just say I'm not reading we're going to the pub all right uh, whereas uh, you know so but what the reason I start with that is I'm just you know you you start out writing you think you're never going to get published and when you get published you think no one's going <laughs> to care and at first they don't <laughs> and so to show up here you know so many miles from home you know and it's hard to leave home uh, and that you're all here, you know, it means the world to me. So thank you very much for, oh. for all coming. <laughs> well, um, thank you, because Marcus has arrived from Australia, leaves again on Wednesday. So we are absolutely blessed to have you here. Thank you so much. Now, that was rather a glib pressy <laughs> of your book. It is, you know, it's about, it's about many things. It's about leaving home. It's about families, music, loss, searching for love. It's really about families too. What, what is it about the family dynamic that interests you so much? Yeah, I honestly don't know. I mean, and even coming back, and the first question was, you know, uh, was fine about, you know, of course, about getting the idea 20 years ago uh, or longer, when I was 20, so it was 24 years ago. And uh, I remember walking around, you know, I still lived at home. I was going to university in Sydney and, uh, you know, most people at home do, do like, commute to university. And uh, that's what I was doing. But I used to go for long walks around my suburb, probably to get away from my dad. <laughs> and uh, and I, would, I remember seeing this image of a boy building a bridge. And he wanted the bridge to be beautiful and perfect. And his one attempt at, at greatness. And, uh, and every book needs a little bit of luck to get it over the line at all its different stages, you know, even to start to even to start writing it. And in this case, it was the idea that just out of pure luck, I called the boy Clayton. And I thought, oh, the story is going to be called Clayton's Bridge. And then a couple of months later, I was walking around the same suburb and I thought, what about Bridge of Clay? The beginning, the end and the title are usually the first three things I think of in a book. And, uh, and as soon as I, s I heard that title in my head, Bridge of Clay, I saw the book flash before my eyes and I saw the ending. And I saw the idea that clay is both a material and a name. And I thought, this is what the character is doing. He's building his life into this bridge. He's moulding himself into this bridge. And the idea being that clay as a material can be moulded into anything, but it needs fire to set it. And that was when I saw the ending. And this doesn't give the ending of the book away, <laughs> by the way. But I thought, what if he just wants to build a bridge and the idea is that the river floods the bridge and that he wants to walk along top of the water. So to sort of transcend humanness just for a moment and the sun is coming up and the reflection's in the water and that's the fire that this needs. And so will he be set? with being able to walk along the top of the bridge or will he be set with failure? And that's always where the book was going. But of course, that's the beauty of being <laughs> a writer of fiction or, or anything at all, is that you always see that ending there. And it's always there and it's always there. And at some point you go, of course, that's not the ending. It's just to the left or to the right of that, or it's just a bit, bit closer than that. And, uh, and so, I actually wrote this book when I was 23. I 
just couldn't, I, I at least had the editorial wherewithal to go, well, that's not it. Uh, you know, it was, it was just not quite there. It wasn't the right story for that time, so I put it aside, and I was putting it aside, putting it aside forever. And, uh, and then I thought, I'm just going to write this one short 100-page novella before Bridge of Clay, which, which was this idea um, of the book thief. And, uh, you know, in 100 pages, you know, it got a bit out of hand. And uh, <laughs> I thought, on, and I just, you know, I honestly thought, I will shut up in a second, is uh, I honestly thought that would be my least successful book uh, because I imagined someone saying to their friends, as it was getting bigger and bigger, uh, I imagined someone on the off chance that they liked it, trying to recommend it to a friend, and the friend says, well, what's it about? <laughs> and you go, well, it's set in Nazi Germany. <laughs> it's narrated by death. <laughs> Nearly everyone dies, uh, and it's 580 pages long. <laughs> You'll love it. Uh, so, so I, yeah, and, and so after that, I thought, right, now it's time to write Bridge of Clay. And it's so funny that it, you know, I, I then started betting everything. I just went, no, you're not going to just write a book that means something to you. You want to write a book that means everything to you. And so when it came to the choice, he's one of how many brothers or how many siblings? And I went, he's got four siblings. He's got four brothers. He's one of five brothers. Let's tell the backstory of the parent of his. I was going to say back to, back to my question about the family. Then, yeah. if, you, if you have this idea at 23, when presumably you don't have a family, and then you're writing it, and you do have a family now, mm -hmm. so that family dynamic must have changed because it's it's so strong in the book. But your perspective on it must have been different from when you came back to it after the book thief. Yeah. So right about the time the book thief started doing really well, my my daughter, who's 13 years old. Uh, was born and and then I started getting to travel the world really on you know it, that book was such a it was a gateway to the world and uh, and of course then four years later our son was born and then of course I did start to see things differently and I started I started really understanding that we are or we start becoming who we are long before we're even born you know, that there are these stories that make us who we are and they go way, way back. And, uh, and so that's why I was interested in telling the story of Penelope and Michael Dunbar, the Dunbar boys, mum and dad. And, uh, and that's, that was where a lot of the, the family stuff started in the book and wasn't just the chaos of the five brothers. And it's quite funny when, when people say to me now, I'm at the crossroad now where... I think as a writer, you're often talking about your childhood and uh, you get a lot of stories from your childhood and now I'm starting to get stories from my own kids. And, uh, you know, and even two of the stories surrounding Bridge of Clay, or my two favourite stories, are about my own children, uh, whereas I used to tell stories about my, my parents and my own siblings. But when, like last July, when I was doing the final edits for Bridge of Clay in the kitchen, I really like working in the kitchen. Uh, it's because there's always something happening in the kitchen. There's always chaos in the kitchen. The best stuff happens in the kitchen. <laughs> and uh, it was seven in the morning. My daughter was eating special K diagonally opposite me. And, uh, and I've looked over. I don't know about all of you, but my children eat like barbarians. <laughs> and uh, I've looked across. There's uh, this is crunching the, you know, that special, you know, that cereal. And there's a bit of outside the bowl and everything. I've looked over finally and I've said, are you all right over there? I'm trying to get some work done here. <laughs> and she's looked at me, she's stopped, the spoon is midway to her mouth and she's stopped and looked at me and she's gone, you work. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I thought about that all day, you know, she's <laughs> gone off to school and then finally by about two o'clock, I thought, right, let's put this to the test. And I don't normally count words <laughs> in a book when I'm writing it, but it, you know, I thought I'm going to. I went to the tools and I, I found I did the word count 128 plus, you know, 128,000 <laughs> words or so. Oh, and then I thought, right, now I'm going to divide that by how many days there are in 13 years. And uh, <laughs> it came out as 1.9 words <laughs> per day. 
<laughs> I thought, God, not even two. <laughs> not even two, you know, and I thought she's actually got a point. <laughs> but I really, um, I love the idea of chaos uh, and chaos in families. And because I'm the youngest of four siblings, you know, that was how we grew up. There was always, there's, and I think, you know, we all invite chaos into our lives. We're always trying to find calm and control yes. but then you know and then so in in our case too i mean we had a dog that was really hard to handle so we got a second dog <laughs> you know and you go what the hell did we do that for and and uh, and so i th i feel like that was one of the um family elements in the book um that really led to it um becoming the book that it was and um now, and I know we talked about it beforehand, but this, I could read just a tiny bit from Love that. Love if, yeah, absolutely. If, um, uh, my, my eldest daughter has five now. boys. So it really, they're little ones. I mean, the eldest is 15. But it, mm -hmm. that dynamic is so beautifully drawn. It's extraordinary. The sort of, the physical affection and the way that they tease each other all the time, but they really see each other. It's so specific and it just powers through the book. Yeah, I, th I feel like there's kind of, there's a lot of water in the book and the, there's basically a tide coming in, which is the history of the family and the tide going out is Clay building the bridge. And so we have those two things happening, but I feel like there's actually a kind of river that runs under that house and it's actually the love these boys have for each other. And, uh, and sometimes... You know, people will ask me about sometimes they're tough on each other. They're really tough, but there's a there's a love in that toughness yeah, you can as feel well. That, yeah. And and can I ask you? There's a lot of music in the book as well. Did you do you listen to music when you're writing? Um, I do sometimes, uh, and sometimes there'll be a soundtrack to a book that I'll play. Like so, when I was writing the book thief, for example, I was listen. One of the things I constantly was listening to was the soundtrack of the film Amelie. Oh, yeah. And oh. uh, and what I would find, what I find, music is one of those testing things in a book that I'm listening. So I remember a kid once asking me at a writers' festival, must have been 13 years old, something like that. He said, "Why do you write?" And that was a really great question. Yeah. And uh, kids always ask the best questions. <laughs> and uh, and he and I said to him, "Okay, I'll tell you why I write." I said, "Because I put my favorite." CDs on or my favourite albums on and I'm waiting for my favourite song on that album and then I start work and then suddenly I realise the music has stopped and I didn't even hear my favourite song. That's when I know that I'm working well. That's, what, that's why I write because I get to feel like that yeah. and I get to not feel the outside world moving outside of me. That's what happens to readers too. That's exactly yeah, and that's what made me want to be a writer, was reading books and uh, knowing, reading fiction and, and then realising that this was all made up, but while I'm in it, I'm believing it. <laughs> I thought, yeah. that's just beautiful. It's such a magic act. And uh, it's what made me want to be a writer in the first place. Well, let's hear it. All right, Great. so um, I will, uh, I'm going to, I do, what I'll do just before I read this is one of those things too. You'd think I'd, I've got the, all these bad memories of going into country Australia. Because I remember reading once in a place called Wodonga and a lady came up to me afterwards. I remember there was a kid at my feet playing with this noise box thing, uh, you know, like a two-year-old. <laughs> and I remember a, a, after the reading, a lady came up to me and said, I really like your books, but your reading is atrocious. Uh, and you think, oh my God, did you really just say that to me? But you know, <laughs> that's what happens when you're a writer. You go out in public and you think, why the hell did I do that? Uh, <laughs> and so, but what I, so it's not, I'm not putting off the reading for that reason. <coughs> I'm just gonna, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tell you before I do the reading, I'm just quickly gonna tell, as quickly as I can, tell you the second favorite story surrounding this book. And it was, was, when my son was four years old, we went on holiday, three hours from Sydney, down the coast, it was really hot, you know, it was 39 degrees, and I did something really unusual for me, and I, I washed my car. And, because uh, <laughs> I'm not precious about my car or anything like that, and I took my, I did something even more unusual, because I was out the front, but I took my T-shirt off, and I just started brushing, you should see the state of my car, <laughs> two kids, two dogs, 
you know, that my car is full of dog hair, sand and lolly wrappers. <laughs> and, uh, but I was just brushing sand out of the car with my T-shirt that I took off. Now, my son came around the corner and he was four years old and uh, he stopped dead in his tracks. Now, my kids, the important thing here is to note that there's always a story before the story or inside the story. And in this case, it's that my children don't call me dad. My kids call me pop. And the reason they call me Pop is that I unearthed all these old Dr. Seuss books, part of which is the Berenstain Bears. Oh, yeah. And, you know, the dad is always <laughs> trying to teach the kid in that something, but the dad's a real idiot. <laughs> and, so, and, and in those books, the kids call him Pop. And so my kids start calling me Pop. <laughs> and, uh, and so when my son came around the corner and he saw me with my T-shirt off, brushing sand out of my car, he stopped in his tracks and he just went, hey, Pop, what are you doing here in just your nipples? <laughs> uh, and, uh, and so then it, was m then it was me who stopped. I've just gone, that, that's genius. You know, and I'm, I'm not one of those parents, don't get me, I'm not one of those parents who thinks their kids are little, you know, geniuses and advanced. And no, my kids are just normal, you know, generally nice kids. And of, but of course, the, every four-year-old is a genius. <laughs> every four-year-old child, because they, they're still learning language and they're still learning words and how to put them together. And, uh, and that's what makes them so great. And of course, the second thought I had at that moment was, I might be able to use that. <laughs> and, uh, and on that note, I will just read a little bit, because it is about, the, here are those sort of moments. So this is Clay. Matthew is the narrator of the story. He's the eldest of the five Dunbar boys, and you'll see from there um, where we're going. You don't need to know much more. Once in the tide of Dunbar Pass, there were five brothers, but the fourth of us was the best of us and a boy of many traits. How did clay become clay anyway? In the beginning, there was all of us, each our own small part to tell the whole, and our father had helped every birth. He was first to be handed to hold us. As Penelope liked to tell it, he'd be standing there, acutely aware, and he'd cry at the bedside, beaming. He never flinched at the slop or the burnt-looking bits as the room began to spin. For Penelope, that was everything. When it was over, she'd succumbed to dizziness. Her heartbeat leapt in her lips. It was funny, they liked to tell us, how when we were born, we all had something they loved. Me, it was my feet, the newborn crinkly feet. Rory, it was his punched-up nose when he first came out and the noises he made in his sleep. Something like a world title fight, but at least they knew he was alive. Those descriptions are exactly my children when they were born. <laughs> I loved my daughter's crinkly looking feet. And when our son was born, he came out and his nose <laughs> was squashed across his face. <laughs> and we said to the doctor, have a look at his nose. And the doctor leaned in and he went, oh yeah. And he reached out and he just went, <laughs> and then it was straight. And we went, how good is that? And, uh, training. and uh, yeah, but it was just one of those moments. Henry had ears like paper. Tommy was always sneezing. And of course, there was Clay between us, the boy who came out smiling. As the story went, when Penny was in labor with Clay, they left Henry, Rory and me with Mrs. Chilman. On the drive to the hospital, they nearly pulled over. Clay was coming quickly. As Penny would later tell him, the world had wanted him badly, but what she didn't do was ask why. Was it to hurt, to humiliate, or to love and make great? Even now, it's hard to decide. Now, I'll just move on to just this one last little piece, and you'll understand why, and it's just a little bit more, if that's okay? Sure. Okay. In those days, too, I remind myself, our parents were something else. Sure, they fought sometimes, they argued, there was the odd suburban thunderbolt, but they were mostly those people who'd found each other. They were golden and bright lit and funny. Often they seemed in cahoots somehow, like jailbirds who wouldn't leave. They loved us, they liked us, and that was a pretty good trick. After all, take five boys, put them in one small house and see what it looks and sounds like. It's a porridge of mess and fighting. 
I remember things like meal times and how sometimes it got too much, the forks dropping, the knives pointing, and all those boys' mouths eating. They'd be arguing, elbowing, food all over the floor, food all over our clothes. And how did that piece of cereal end up there, on the wall, until a night came when Rory sealed it? He spilt half his soup down his shirt. Our mother didn't panic. She stood, cleaned up, and he would eat the rest of it, shirtless. And our father got the idea. We were all still celebrating when he said it. Go on, he said. You lot too. Hendra and I nearly choked. Sorry? You didn't hear me, he said. Ah, oh, shit, said Henry. Should I make you take your pants off too? For a whole summer, we ate like that. Our T-shirts heaped near the toaster. <laughs> to be fair, though, and to Michael Dunbar's credit, from the second time onwards, he took his own shirt off with us. Tommy, who was still in that beautiful phase when kids speak totally unfiltered, shouted, Hey, hey, Dad. What are you doing here in just your nipples? <laughs> Told you I'd use it. <laughs> the rest of us roared with laughter, especially Penny Dunbar. But Michael was up to the task, a slight flickering in one of his triceps. And what about your mum, you blokes? Should she go shirtless too? <laughs> she never needed rescuing, but it was Clay who'd often be willing. No, he said, but she did it. Her bra was old and scruffy looking. It was faded, strapped to each breast. She ate and smiled regardless. She said, now don't go burning your chests. We knew what to get her for Christmas. <laughs> and it's funny even looking at something like that, that you remember, even though you've struggled with a book for more than a decade, that just the little joys you had and the, that description of Penny Dunbar's underwear tormented me for quite a while towards the end. And because it was always described as old and broken looking, and I tried several things in that spot. And it's the one thing I can say about this book is that every word is accounted for. Every word is deliberate. And, uh, you know, and even the beginning, which I think a lot of people find chaotic, it's all there for a reason and that you don't need to know everything straight away. You know, I think we're lost in the world now because we need to know everything straight away and we don't really want to know it that well. Well, you said that the novel is the sort of sentinel of the way we don't know the world. Yeah. Absolutely and right. And, you know, and searching for the right word at that moment, finally one morning I opened my eyes and I went, scruffy. <laughs> and it, I immediately reeled all the way back to my own childhood and seeing all our clothes hanging up on the clothesline and that's what the underwear looked like. <laughs> scruffy and scrappy and stringy, you know, and uh, as soon as I saw that, it was a different me relating to the world of the book. And, uh, and I think that's, again, what you're always trying to find in fiction is at some point, no matter how far removed from that world you are, you somehow find yourself in it. Oh, and yeah. uh, which is the other thing that I've always loved about fiction. And it's my first love as a reader. And, uh, and you know, and it'll be my last as well, I think. Well, Penelope, the boy's mother, the many-named woman, she's, she's such a fantastic character. And obviously she has a pivotal relationship initially with her own father, which really tests the reader, I think, the way that they are together. Were, were you aware of that when you were writing it? I know both of your parents were immigrants, weren't they? But, but the way that he has to let her go, I'm not spoiling anything by saying that because it's obvious that she has left, but it's such a, she's so strong and yet so centred and soft. Yeah, I, it's funny... I didn't realise what, you know, there were, you, I think you sit down and you start writing and you know where you want to go and I plot quite meticulously, I write my chapter headings over and over again because I want to feel like I can roll out of bed in the morning and land in the world of the book and, uh, and you know, and you know that yourself from your own work where you don't want to feel like your book is miles and miles away. You want to feel like it's there. And that's why it's important to be working on it even when you're not working on it. And Conversation uh, going, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and with Penelope, I just, I finished part one, finally, and I just wrote that sentence, once in the tide of Dunbar Pass, there was a many named woman. <laughs> and I backed that up a few sentences later with, she came from a watery wilderness. And I immediately made the connection there and I saw and I you know you don't know the best thing again I mean I think there are so many 
I think it's probably fairly obvious. Um, you know, I'm sit here and I, generally in life, I'm just very even and calm. But when I get to talk about writing and when people care, I can't kind of get the smile off my face and I can't shut up, you know. Uh, but actually, that's one of your hallmarks is that, you know, you are so generous about the writing process. I think that some writers want to keep it to themselves. Yeah. But you share your process with people, and which is remarkable. And I, I think it's because I've never considered myself an artist uh, and I don't consider myself that well educated or anything like that either. I'm just, I'm a tradesman and I get up and I, I go to work and, uh, and I'm just... You know, and, and I find it really hard, and uh, but I but I love that it's not easy as well, and and so, but yeah, but you you toil away and you have these, you know, really nice moments where you go, God, I didn't know I was going to write that sentence today, and it's not because you think it's the most brilliant sentence ever written, but it's it's the fact that it it's you're getting to know the book as you write it, and uh, and in that case. I, I'd admit, I had immediately named all of the animals in the Dunbar household. There are five, but one of them is a mule. And, uh, and half this book is written around that goddamn mule. <laughs> uh, yep. So much so there's horse racing in the book because of that mule. <laughs> Everything, you know, so many things. And the mule's name is Achilles. And, uh, and uh, there's a goldfish named Agamemnon, a cat named Hector. The pigeon was pushing it. His name's Telemachus, <laughs> and uh, and the, there was a and there's a border collie named Rosie, <laughs> and uh, that seems like the anomaly. But the Rosie name <laughs> comes from the rosy fingered dawn. That is always so. Just like Homer repeats the watery wilderness and uh, you know the wine dark sea, so he he mentions the the rosy fingered dawn so much that Tommy, the youngest Dunbar boy when Penelope's still alive and reading those books to these boys. And that's the other thing that I've, I always found interesting. So when I say I'm not that well educated, and I'm not, but books and, you know, you know, just going to a regular school, you can still have these things opened up for you. And I like the idea that your intelligence can also be a bit deceptive. And you can have gone just to a normal state school, but you've been shown Homer and you'll find it and you'll read it and you love the, like in my case, I loved how overwrought it is and I loved how all the characters have nicknames <laughs> and, uh, and that all made its way into the book because, and I think this is at the heart of everything is that, with this book, is that it's sort of a, a suburban epic and I think that's why I let Homer kind of run through it in that way because we all think we've got these dull, average, less than average lives, but then you realise we all fall in love, we all have people die on us, we all at some point have a moment, even like I had two nights of last Wednesday, you know, where I rushed my dog, you know, big behemoth dog <laughs> to the vet at four in the morning, you know, to get his stomach cut open and so that he could survive and I had to wake my kids beforehand to say goodbye to him because we thought that may be the last time and so you know so we all have and we have people die on us and yeah. we have friendships that waver and and uh, big arguments in the kitchen and so I thought I wanted to celebrate the bigness of our lives because we often forget that they are big. Well, there are many, many fantastic themes through the book but, but that, that relationship between Penny and her father is, is really one of the things, isn't it, about you have to let go. If you love, you have to let go. And it's so poignant to read. Really well, yeah, and he, so she calls her dad. I knew, there were, I, knew I was coming back to this. <laughs> uh, she calls her dad the statue, the statue of Stalin, or that was his nickname. And there again, that was just a line that I put in, and I went, I don't know where that came from. It's just, it's like climbing a mountain but then at the top of the mountain, after you've done all the hard work, there's the promise of a sand pit <laughs> where you get to play. And then you write something like, he was likened not to Stalin himself, because this part of the book is in Eastern Europe. And uh, he, they likened him not to Stalin himself, but to a statue of him. And uh, from that moment on, he became the statue of Stalin. And he's got that really sort of tough, silent exterior and you know, and, and when she's making mistakes at the piano, her, the first nickname she has in the book is the mistake maker. He's just got a spruce tree branch and he just hits her knuckles. 
you know, just not very hard, <laughs> but, you know, then it says the record was 27 times for 27 musical sins. And, uh, and then finally he holds them and he says, Juz Vestaci, which is Polish for that's enough. That's enough, mistake maker. And people say, you know, people who've read the book and people close to me say that's the first time that they get a bit teary reading the book. And he does sure. say to her when she's left and she's immigrated to Australia that that moment on the train platform where she says to him, I'll see you later. And he says, yeah, see you later. But in his mind, he's saying, no, you <laughs> won't. Yeah, uh, he says that's the, it was the, the greatest moment of his life. And I think, uh, you know, that's, that, you know, that then filters through when you've got Matthew at the, towards the very end of the book sitting at the piano with his own, with his own daughter and, and uh, you know, he's got the branch of a eucalypt tree, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and, it, and, and it was fueled again by me sitting at the piano with my own kids, you know, and with my daughter, for example. We just had to have one big fight at the beginning of every school term and then everything was good, <laughs> you know, and then we'd sit there and, uh, and I think, it's one of the things, there's a chapter in the book called Piano Wars, where they say, everyone thinks it's because our mum died and our dad left us that we're tough. But it's not, we're <laughs> tough because of the piano. <laughs> you know, and uh, being those kids who were made to learn the piano and they have to fight their way through school because, uh, because of all of the accusations about what the playing the piano <laughs> means. It'll be your turn in a moment. I just have one question about, about the language because some bits of this are, are written in a, in a poem, really. I, had to, I actually had to read them aloud because they are so lyrical. Do you, do you start from saying them aloud or are you hearing that in your head? What was your process? I was fascinated by it. Mm, in the process, of, like, as I started writing this book and once I started naming the animals, you know, giving them Greek <laughs> names and all of that, and I started thinking of it as one big, long poem, and uh, and it made sense just that and there w and it related to the idea of the rhythm of the storytelling and the bigness of the story too and I found that I really liked writing like that and uh, so you're just always treading that fine line because I didn't want it to be a verse novel but I wanted it to have a cadence that sort of went through the middle and you could veer either side but it always came back to that and. Uh, and it just allowed me to have Matthew write in a particular way that wasn't necessarily educated in, uh, you know, in a, in a prissy sort of sophisticated way, but had, but had an intelligence to it nonetheless. It's very grounded. Yeah, very again, grounded. that idea of you can be intelligent without being intelligent, you know, with a, a you know, a capital I. Uh, and. Uh, yeah, because I look at my dad, who was a house painter, and uh, uh, all through my childhood, I just always remember him reaching for the for the Britannicas, you know. So there was that idea of, you know, that just because I'm a tradesman, it doesn't mean I'm, you know, that that I don't that I'm not interested in things. I'm not interested in the world, and uh, and that's how I wanted these characters to be. They're very rough at the edges, but but they have intelligent souls, and. Uh, and yeah, and sure, they'll have a big fight on the front yard, but then they'll s they'll Watch tell each other stories. <laughs> yeah, and uh, but they'll and <laughs> but they'll find um, beauty in the little things as well, and uh, and so all of those little bits and pieces will sort of, you know, what made up this family because every family is unique. Yeah, but it's that that intelligence of knowing that you don't know stuff, isn't it? The, the ability to admit, really, which they all have, and they're so hungry for it too, in between eating each other up, which I <laughs> recognise. Um, thank you. I'd, lo I'd love some questions from you now, so perhaps <coughs> we could have the lights up a bit so we can see where you are. That would be, ah, fabulous. Actually, when you said, I'm not an artist, I think I felt about 700 people kind of going, yeah, you are. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, it's good up. to, it's, uh, I think, yeah, I always come into things, I think if you come in with an arrogant frame of mind, yeah. um, you, you're sort of doomed to fail. So I think I start out going, all right, I know nothing. And you learn to, to write every book like it's your first book yeah. all over again, really. Well, I think as a reader, you're very aware of the fact that you're kind of grabbing them by the hand and saying, come on, I'm going to show you some stuff. And it's such a, oh, it's intoxicating. I want you all to read it. Have we got a hand up for the first question? Let me just 
Over there? Just Super. Go for your and if you want to put your hand up for the second question, there are several mics. There's someone we'll in the blue t shirt up there. And yeah, someone we'll there. try and get them to you really quickly so we don't lose out. Thank you. Just keep your hand up until we've got a microphone for you. Did we get a microphone down here ready for the second question? Thanks. Okay, over to you. Yes, you spoke a lot about writing the book. How was it releasing the book then into the thing? Because uh, a lot of the marketing was it's the new book from the author of The Book Thief. Did that add a lot of pressure or was it, did it make it easier to get it out there? Uh, thanks for asking that. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's, it was really interesting the day that it went to the printer and my publisher called me and she said, it's over, you know, you must be ecstatic, you know, and, uh, and typical writer, you know, we're never happy unless we're complaining. Uh, and I, I, I said, no, I'm, I'm actually a bit miserable, <laughs> you know, because I think you spend, you know, I think what you forget when you're, you're finishing something and you're working on so it is it's everything and I was working kind of just really late nights back to back doing last edits for different territories just li different little things and uh, and you know you spend all of these years with all of these characters that you love and you sort of feel like you would want to die for and then you, you're not working on it anymore and so you think God, I spent all that time complaining about them <laughs> and now I'm wondering how the hell I'm going to live without them. And, uh, but I think that's what gets you to your next book and, uh, you know, and I think you write your next book to atone for the sins of the last <laughs> one. And, and when it goes to the printer, you know that there are still things that you wish you could fix. And, uh, but it's taken out of your hands by then. And, uh, but, but um, yeah, I think the fact... I try not to worry about those things like, oh, it's the new book from the author of The Book Thief. And I sort of made my peace with the idea that people would always compare it to that book. And, I mean, I think technically and page for page, word for word, this is a, a much better book than The Book Thief. But The Book Thief has got something of its own magic in it that's got nothing to do with me. It's sort of, it, it's a lucky book and it's got this exuberance in it that I look at it and go, God, I would change that, I would <laughs> take that out. It's a, I always felt like I went a bit too far with that book, but I think it was better to go too far than not far enough. And, uh, but, um, but I'm less embarrassed by the writing in this book. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, but, but at the same time, you start to look back nostalgically on your early work and it's now that it, I look back on my very first books and I think, oh, so lovely, what a great time. You know, whereas a year after it, at that time I was going, oh my God, you know, you're always freaking out most about the book you just wrote. And so I've been very worried about this book and, and the one thing I'll say to people is, and I alluded to it earlier, is the beginning does challenge people and, uh, it, you know, people sort of go, I don't know where this is, I don't know... And what I do say is, yeah, you don't need to know everything straight away. It will, it is worth fighting for, and uh, and you know, like a, you know, and you'll find something out. You know, you'll get a clue to something on page, you know, seventy six, and you won't get the answer to it until page three hundred and seventy six. <laughs> but that's how our lives kind of are, you know, and uh, you know, so. Yeah, uh, 13 years was long enough between <laughs> books and it, that will never, ever happen again. <laughs> Actually, that could be... <laughs> that's a very big promise that is coming a big from promise. me. Yeah, there are people in the room who are going to note that. <laughs> Plus, you were doing four simultaneous edits, weren't you, which is a technical achievement in itself. That's an extraordinary thing to do. Yeah, and, uh, you know, we all promised that I wouldn't end up doing that, but then when it's coming out in America and the UK and Australia, sort of simultaneously, you just want to get everything right. And it's not that there are any differences in the book, but you make a change in one and you go, now I've got to put those <laughs> changes into that one. And then you do it for that and you've got to put them in there. And so instead of doing a 500-page edit, you're doing a 3,000-page edit yeah. and uh, trying to keep it all it's consistent. Massive. Right. Does somebody have a microphone? I hope they do. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Oh, that's all right. Sorry, I'll repeat the question. Okay, it sounds a little bit at the end that you were crying, mm -hmm. and I was crying too, and I just wondered how that whole process works. Do you do it in a day or, you know? Yeah. 
Mm. Okay, so the question was about the audio version of Bridge of Clay, which I ended up reading, and uh, my publisher at home asked me to do that, and and so I sort of it was a p it was the perfect way to say goodbye to the book, and so I could read like I, when I did last when I would do my last read throughs of Bridge of Clay on my own, I would read it aloud anyway, and uh, and I would read it in pretty much a day and a half. And uh, but I was like a machine by then. Like I, when I say a machine, I was just I lived and breathed that book. And when it came to do the audio version, it took about a week and a half uh, because you can only work so many hours in the day. With the uh, you're supposed to do four or five hours, but we were doing seven or eight hour days. And most of the mistakes. This was the really interesting thing. Most of the mistakes I made were from previous versions of the book where I'd read it a certain way and they'd go and I'd go, oh yeah, we made a last change at the very end. So I was reading from the tape in my head rather than what was in front of me. And uh, and yes, at the very end I read part eight and the epilogue all the way through pretty much. The big problem was my stomach was rumbling and the microphone picks up everything. <laughs> uh, so we actually we had one break in the middle of part eight and I read the whole thing through without stopping and uh, there was a point where I t looked through the curtain and I said to the producer it almost sounded like I was laughing reading that and he just looked at me and he just went didn't sound like you were laughing because I was I was just s I wasn't sobbing but basically just tears were running down my face the whole time and I did read through the book with some trusted sort of friends and colleagues which I've never ever done before. Like this was prior to the, to even getting to edits, and they would say to me, a friend of mine said, "Who is that in your real life that you're crying for as you read that at the end?" And I I felt like saying, "Don't you get it?" But what I said was, "It's not for anyone in my real life. It's for them. They're they're real to me, you know. And when I'm in it, when I'm inside the book, it's it's for them. It's for Penelope herself." And I know she's not real, but she <laughs> is when I'm there. And uh, but that's really what the book meant to me. We did hear one tiny little glitch at the end, towards the end of the book, um, in the recording. But we came back to that on another day, and everyone said we can't possibly read read that again because there was no way of getting back to that level of intensity and emotion. Uh, but I just hung on to it well enough. I I hope. I haven't listened to it, and I probably never will. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yes, up the top there. Hiya. Um, I just wondered if you have ever wanted to bury uh, your typewriter in the back garden that <laughs> happens in this story. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I've always loved typewriters. I love old stuff, and uh, I do have a typewriter, which doesn't work that well. And... Uh, you know, that was, the, the mo that was one of the moments that rescued the book. Originally, Matthew was sitting on... Th the first narrator of this book d isn't even in the book anymore. Uh, it was a girl called Maggie. After six years, I cut her out of the book. And then I had Matthew, the eldest Dunbar boy, sitting on the roof. And then I, I, the book fa was failing and I went, let's stop. I quit the book for less than 24 hours, as it turned out. And I started writing again. And I had Henry, the third brother, narrate. <laughs> I try, everyone had a crack at narrating this book. You know, you've got to go through all these failures to get what works. And I had him go out, and I just had this idea of him uncovering the typewriter. And it was when I wrote the sentence, I went out to an old backyard in an old backyard of a town. And it's not the greatest sentence or phrase in the world, but I went, I took a little breath and I went, oh, you're playing you're playing again. You're actually playing with the words. And then when Matthew describes it as perfect pirateless treasure, you know, just the fact that the word pirateless doesn't actually exist, <laughs> I went, oh, I'm suddenly alive again. And uh, so that was where the silliness of burying the typewriter <laughs> came about. And of course, the idea then of, but you've got to get your measurements right or you might dig up a dead dog or a snake instead, <laughs> uh, which he then says, Let read the book. <laughs> which I did on both counts. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, so, I mean, I would love to do it. I, you know, I had friends, I had a friend of mine who, I don't know, her car stopped working, you, you know, for good. And so 
she and her brothers buried it in the backyard. I mean, people do the weirdest things. And uh, they're the things that you use uh, at the beginning of a book, usually the beginning. <laughs> we got a question from this side, perhaps? Oh, yeah, over there. We also have a question from somewhat from a young person in the audience down here. Okay, in that order then. <coughs> I'll try to be a bit more brief in the <laughs> answers. <too. laughs> I'm not sure. Ah, it is on. I wasn't yep. sure whether it was on. I was interested in your mention of the Pont de Gare in mm -hmm. the book, and I wondered at what stage in your writing had you actually seen the Pont de Gare and whether that really did inspire you? Oh, absolutely. Um, so you say it so much nicer than I would say it. You know, uh, uh, being Australian, you know, uh, Pont de Garde, <laughs> you know, and uh, I, I went there twice. I, I went before I knew I was ever going to write this book. I just wouldn't say I stumbled across it because it's a pretty big thing to stumble across. And uh, so um, for those, you know, so that ac Roman aqueduct with its three tiers of arches and you just stand and look at that and you just go, this, this is incredible. And, uh, and so in 2008 or early 2009, maybe in January, I went to Rome, Florence and Avignon and uh, I went to Rome and Florence to look at sculptures in particular of Michelangelo and I went to Avignon to be able to go to Pont de Garde and of course uh, I remember going there, I missed the train connection, I ended up being late, I'm trying to speak French to people and then I, I, got, I ended up sprinting in in a cab to Avignon, I was going on a tour of Pont de Garde and all these other places and I got there and I'm, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm running late. I'm going, oh God, I'm hopeless. And uh, being the middle of January, I finally got to the office. So the people running the tour actually came to the hotel, and they said, "Don't worry, you're the only one doing the tour." <laughs> and so, and so I got this personalised tour of um, the Pont de Garde and uh, and surrounding areas, and it had a huge impact uh, on the book, and it made me want to, I always thought clay is going to build arches and it gave me the structure of the book and this is one of the, you're going to, this is I think where you get to see someone go, God yeah, this, that's a, you know, just to be sort of nerdy about writing in a, hopefully a good way, whereas if you look at the structure of the book, everything gets added, everything is building, so it's part one is cities, then it's part two is cities plus waters, then cities plus waters plus criminals, so the bridge is sort of being built but if you look at the actual number of chapters, all of, the, all of the parts have 12 chapters except two, the second and the seventh. And if you draw that kind of in a way, that's what creates the two arches that Clay builds his bridge out of. And uh, so everything is there for a reason, whether people see it or don't see it. And it's those little things that sort of add to your own knowledge of the book. But Pont de Garde meant a huge amount, as did the Statue of David and the slaves. More importantly, the slaves, um, those sculptures that are unfinished that lead to David because I wanted Clay to be able to say, you know, I, you know I'd love to create greatness like the David, but I, st but I feel more like the slaves. And because uh, I think that's actually how we all live. We're all becoming and we're all trapped in a way in the marble. So I hope that answered your question yeah, about exactly. Pont de Garde. Absolutely, but this will have to be so a really quick question. I'm sorry to be bossy, <coughs> but it will. How did you get the idea for The Book Thief? Okay, so the idea for The Book Thief came in all sorts of different ways. Uh, the that sounds like it's going to be a long answer. <laughs> I'll be really quick. <laughs> all right, so We're my mum well. and dad, when, uh, so how are you, do you have brothers and sisters? No? Okay. So I was the youngest of four kids and everyone says the youngest child is always spoilt. But it's always never the way you think. <laughs> I was spoilt in that I got to spend meaningful time with my mum and dad as a teenager. I didn't get their attention when I was really young, but I got it when my sisters had moved out, my brother was off doing other things, and I'd go on long trips with my bushwalks with my dad I'd go to work with my mum and with my dad and I'd say can you tell me about what it was like growing up in Germany and Austria you know during and after World War II and they told these amazing stories and when I started writing the book thief those stories just well it was like 
scratching something open in my head and I pulled that world out that they told me about. Now, the Liesl, as a book thief, though, came because I'd written a book. I'd written the first page of a story set in Sydney of a girl stealing a book, and I thought, oh, I might just put that in that book I'm setting in Nazi <laughs> Germany. And then the idea of using death as a narrator came from writing stories with some kids at a school I was working in, and I went, oh, I use death as the narrator. I might just put that book, <laughs> put that in that book I'm setting in Nazi Germany. All your best ideas are often just good fortune of just sitting down and actually writing. That's where you get your best ideas usually. Well, I think it's fair to say that we could listen to you all day. There is so much richness in, not just in your book, but in what you do and the way you talk about it. So I feel really blessed to be sitting here and on your behalf, thank you very much. Can we thank Janet that. as well, please? <laughs> Thanks, Janet. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Marcus, Marcus will, of course, be signing next door in the accompanying tent. If you just give us two minutes to leave before you so that he can be ready for you. And